In 2019, the word screen time was added to the official Merriam-Webster dictionary. They listed the definition as time spent watching television, playing a video game, or using an electronic device with a screen, such as a smartphone or tablet. Obviously, the idea was present a long time ago, but it's definitely risen to the level of popular usage in recent years. I saw this post recently on social media. Check this out. It says, my daughter just kissed the iPad and whispered, I love you. So that's how cutting down on screen time is going. <laughs> I think as parents, we've all been there. Now, I was born in the 80s, raised in the 90s. I don't ever remember my parents discussing my screen time with me uh, or with each other. But there was a general sense that being outside and playing was a good idea and that too much video games, too much TV was not a good idea. But I was the kid who would you know, play a basketball video game for like an hour and then go outside and shoot hoops for two. I had one friend whose mom, I remember, threw their TV out in the garbage, out to the curb. I thought that was a little crazy at the time. I had another friend whose mom would routinely use the phrase mushy brain as the danger if you watch too much TV, and I just thought that was an overreaction. But admittedly, the prevalence of screens and access to social media didn't really take off till I was much older, moving into high school and college. I'm old enough to still remember my first text message, and I only had 250 texts a month to use, but I think I only used like 12. But now, as a parent, I'm raising kids in a world that's very different from the one I grew up with, and you're watching this, so you're probably uh, in that same situation. Now, my wife and I, we met in middle school. We were friends for years before we started dating, but we laugh sometimes at the memory of discussing during the school day. So when are you going to be online tonight? The internet was a destination we went to. Now for our kids, they have it all around them. They've got two robot butlers to answer. Siri, with the most, re you know, any question they have, or how many times have we heard in the last month, Alexa, play the Encanto soundtrack. Too many to count. Hopefully I just started that at your house too. So what do we make of the technology that's so pervasive and so accessible? The truth is we're still learning what these technologies are doing to us, and the advancement of tech is moving faster than even our studies can keep up. For example, now we've got historical data linking cigarette smoke to lung cancer. We know that cigarettes are bad for us and the technological advancement of cigarettes is relatively unchanged over the last several hundred years with maybe the exception of the filter, which was invented in 1925. I had to look that up. But we know we can make a pretty sound assessment. Smoking cigarettes is not good for your health. But in the world of tech, our advancements are not once every hundred years, which gives us ample time to study and analyze and adapt we're lucky to get 100 days between the announcement of a new Apple product or software update. So how can we study, analyze, and adapt, make wise choices about how or if we'll engage with some new tech? Or maybe a bigger question is this. Should we really assume that all technological progress is taking us in the direction we want to go? And what are we progressing towards? And is that what's even best for us? Well, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In his book, Habits of the Household, Justin Early says this. He says, Paul seems to assume that formation is the default. We are either being formed, conformed to the world, or we're being formed, transformed by God. The human heart is never not being shaped by something. something. So you can instantly see how this affects our parenting. My wife and I, we've got two kids, a daughter born in 2014, a son born in 2018. So they're seven and three as I speak today. So I'm going to be speaking from the advantage of parenting young children, elementary age and younger. Check back in with me in 2029 and maybe I'll have something to say about middle and high school kids. Maybe not. But I share this with you so that you know that I'm in the trenches with, trenches with you. And what I'm going to share is for me just as much as it is for you. How are our kids being shaped and what are we allowing to form them? Have we outsourced the formation of our kids to a screen and, and what's been the result? I think these are good questions for us to wrestle with. So some of the things I'm going to share, we've, we've done well. Others we struggle in and I'm, I'll be honest about that. But the goal is that we have a path forward for the world of tech that our children are going to grow up in. So here are four healthy habits for young children and technology. Number one, screens are not good cures for boredom. That This just needs to be said out loud, okay? It's okay for your kids to be bored. That boredom can foster creativity and ingenuity if we don't short-circuit that process by just giving them a phone whenever they're bored. So when your child tells you, I'm bored, say, good. Let's think about how we can use our brains to cure our boredom. And there's plenty of non-screen-related solutions 
to offer them, you know, things like books and crayons or, I don't know, go outside. But there are two specific areas that require some diligence when you're in the car and when you're at the dinner table. I want to encourage you as strongly as possible to make these device free with almost no exceptions. One time I was driving and I passed a vehicle with a mom that was driving the car and three kids in the car, one in the front, two in the back. All the kids had headphones or earbuds in. All of them had their heads down, I presume looking at their phones. I almost expected mom to be doing that too while she was driving. Now, as parents, we've all had really hard days, so I'm not picking on this family. It just might have been one of those days, but I'll ask you, Is that the norm in your family or is it the exception? Here's the thing. The car is an incredibly rich opportunity for conversation. In his book, The Tech Wise Family, Andy Crouch, he talks about car time is conversation time. This was true in my own life as a child and it influences me today. For example, my dad, he picked me up from school nearly every day of my life. I never took the bus. The only reason it stopped is because I got my own car. But from kindergarten through like 10th grade, I had this daily appointment with my dad in the car. And it was just a short five minute car ride, but it became this filter for how I interpreted the day's events. I estimated that we had like 2000 rides like this. And that's only the ones that were coming home from school. I've told many people, even my dad, that this is how I think God gave me a filter that's built on scripture, that every life event had to pass through the filter of scripture. So I learned how to think, not just what to think. So my dad would say, Well, Romans 13 says such and such, so how do you think you should respond to that teacher that's giving you a hard time? Now, as I grew older, the issues got more complex, but I really think that I was set up for a lifetime of learning how to process through what God has said, and that, of course, helps me to this day. So think about what process you might be short-circuiting when you put on the minivan's minivan's built-in DVD player on that 10-minute drive to Wegmans. Maybe save it for a long road trip or when it's like a really tough day, but keep the car time for conversation time. Meals are another opportunity we can easily miss out on. In this season of parenting young children, we have this in common, we're tired. (laughs) We get it, right? Whether we work inside or outside of the home, whether we're behind an assembly line or behind a desk or behind a kitchen counter, some days we're just tired as parents. I get it, I've not just been there, I am there, okay? But allow this to be your guiding principle for mealtime. The TV's off, phones are in the other room. Leave it charging in the kitchen and give your kids and your spouse your full focus. Teach your kids that we talk to each other about our day and we learn what matters to one another. So my wife bought these awesome cards that have some conversation starters on them like, what's your idea of a perfect day? Or what's one new skill you'd like to learn? It's really been great. But our son, who's three, he can't read, but he still wants to take his turn reading a card. So he'll look at the card and make something up like, What would you do if a shark was in your house? But the funny thing about a a three-year-old is every card he starts is the same way. What would you do if a llama was in your house? What would you do if a giraffe, you know? And we've had more laughs over these cards than I could have ever imagined. Plus, we've gotten to learn some cool things about each other. So we leave the screens in the other room at mealtime. They're not good cures for boredom. Number two, children don't own devices. They borrow them. This might be a subtle shift, but it makes a big difference. Let me explain. So we've got in our house two very, very old iPads. I'm like talking OG iPad that only get trotted out when we travel. They're really slow. They don't do much of anything except play some downloaded videos. I don't even try to stream with these things. They're not going to make it. But every once in a while, I get asked, Dad, can I have my iPad? And I gently remind our kids, these iPads actually belong to me and Mom but we're happy to let you use them under certain circumstances. So take care of them and bring them back in good condition. Now, we've all seen, or we've all been, the kid who screamed out, hey, that's mine. In addition to the fact that we're teaching our kids that everything they have belongs to God, it's also important at these ages that they know that they don't just use these things carte blanche. Now, when you have a 17-year-old, I hope you'll be having a different discussion. But as the parent of a small, young child, they've not yet developed the discipline or the self-control that's necessary. They will someday, and we're training them for that, but it's not yet. So just as an aside, we don't do this with everything in the house, like in some weird way, like this cereal belongs to me and mom, and we're letting you eat it. No. But until a later age, and for this time, and because of the incredible power that these devices have, these are my devices that I'm allowing you to use. And it's okay to teach your child that the way that they handle this responsibility, how they react when you say, okay, it's time to turn off the movie, That's gonna be an indicator to tell us how ready they are for more responsibility. 
Here's a third healthy habit. Parents should model the behavior they wish to see in their kids. I've got a tough question for you, and it's tough for me. Do your children view your device as an appendage? How often do they see us without our phones? Will their earliest memories be of your eyes looking down at a device or your face partially obscured by a computer screen? Now, don't mishear me. I don't think that you and your five-year-old have to abide by the same screen rules, just like I don't think that you should give up coffee because your five-year-old doesn't need caffeine, right? Like, that's why coffee's for grown-ups. This would be an overreaction. But do some internal reflecting. What habits will your kids learn from you based on how you handle your devices? So tonight, when you put them to bed, put your phone to bed in the other room first. When it's family movie night, leave your phone charging on the charging station in the kitchen. When you get in the car and you drive down the street and you realize out loud, oh, I forgot my phone at home, follow that up with, but that's okay, I can go without it and mean it. But last, fourth, teach them to create, not just consume. Now, think about the different parts of the brain that are used when we watch something versus when we make something, even with like Legos, which transcend all generations as a valuable tool for creativity. You're engaging so many different facets of your brain. Now, if you're like me and you like to follow the instruction booklet perfectly, you're reading a page, searching for the piece, analyzing which way it goes, and on and on. Now, if you're like my wife, like freestyle Legos, you're dreaming it up from scratch and using even more of the creative juices. But how much mental energy does it take to binge watch a show on Disney Plus? So here's an idea. Help your kids explore the world of content creation. Teach them to create media, not just consume it. Since our devices are so powerful, let's use them for that benefit. We've got like mobile television studios and recording studios in our pockets. You don't have to be like a tech guru. So many of these things are designed to be simple and chances are if you can't figure it out, your kids will. I remember in the earliest days of the COVID pandemic, we were obviously all at home a lot together. Our daughter was five going on six when we had this idea to create Giovanna's video podcast. So I set up my phone in a simple uh, tripod and had like a cheap $20 microphone I bought on Amazon. And I just turned on my phone camera. Well, she talked for seven minutes. This was her idea about what to do when you're upset or angry. She even created this free additional resource that was a four-step process plagiarized, I think, from Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood that we mailed to some friends, literally in the mail, who enjoyed the podcast. And we had the best time making it. Yes, tech was at the center of it, but it was there to serve our purposes not the other way around. So create a cover of your favorite song. Create a music video of your family band, no matter how terrible it is. Use iMovie or something like it to create a fake movie trailer for a film that never exists in which your kids are the main characters. Put your phone on airplane mode. Walk around the neighborhood and practice taking pictures of different kinds of birds or trees or cars. All of this reinforces that the tech serves us. It is not our master. We can use it without being, becoming dominated by it. And in the process, you'll make some awesome family memories. So in summary, I want to remind you of our objective of where we're going. When Pastor Jerry preached on parenting uh, last year in 2021, he said the point of parenting is making disciples of Jesus. That's what we're after. We're creating the atmosphere for disciples to grow, an environment for them to flourish and grow in faith. But this requires constant attention and calibration. Sometimes I come home from work to find that the thermostat has been adjusted and not because someone was too cold or too hot, but I think because my son likes to watch the thermostat screen change color to orange when he turns it up to like 85 degrees. So while I'd like to think that I could just set the temperature and forget about it, the truth is with kids, it all requires ongoing attention. And that applies here. These are not just rules to set and forget about or like become legalistic. It requires ongoing attention to your child, adapting to their changes and reactions, monitoring how they respond. And of course, technology is always advancing and changing, so we need to be ready to adapt in all of it. But I want you to remember where we're going. We want to see them flourish as disciples and that when they leave the nest someday, and they will, they will be equipped to make their own God-honoring decisions, particularly with technology.